always do these at 5 to 6 p.m. on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday night. But today we really wanted to highlight the research of one of our GNET contributors, as well as being a PhD student and our only solo PhD author for our reports this year. So I think to start, so I will just do a short introduction and then Elsa will go through their report uh, for about 30 minutes and there'll be time for Q&A at the end. So Elsa is a P Elsa Bank Bankston Mueller uh, is a PhD candidate at the Department of Politics and I IR at Goldsmiths University of London. Elsa holds an MSc in Comparative Politics, Political Thought, and a B in Politics from SOAS, also University of London. You're a fan. Yeah, I know. It's like a, okay. it's a chain. So Elsa's research focuses on misogyny, online gender-based violence, anti-feminist theory, and approaches to the politics of cyberspace. And in, in their doctoral research, Elsa develops a feminist methodology for researching anti-feminist online cultures through the use and theorization of emotions and effect. So today we're here to launch the report. The title is here for you, A Feminist Theorization of Cybersecurity to Identify and Tackle Online Extremism. So this is a beautiful way to build on our last panel. So I'm gonna hand it over to Elsa. We're thrilled, I'm so proud. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you so much for the organization of this uh, conference and the lab. All, all the panels have just been amazing and very thought provoking and useful. Um, so yeah, I will uh, present the report I've written um, uh, for GNET. Um, I won't be able to go through everything, of course, but please do read it. Um, uh, just before I go into the things I'm saying this, um, I want to emphasize that this should be seen uh, as some kind of approach to help us to deal with uh, some issues that are currently marginalized in in, in general traditional or hegemonic um, internet extremism centered policies. So for example, in cybersecurity frameworks and PCV uh, frameworks uh, for policies. Uh, so with that as well, it is an approach, so it also needs to adapt to particular context. That's what we said in the previous panel. Uh, you will probably notice that I will repeat some stuff. Uh, I do generally agree with everything that was said in the previous panel. Uh, as well as approaches to how we should deal with violence in, in general and uh, the politics uh, that it actually stems from. So, um, how do I switch? This is a bit. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so just the outline uh, through uh, what I will go through. I will start with the research questions. I'm exploring the report. And they just give you some brief context to what I am mainly basing or the, the context you need for the argument um, um, in this report, the main one that informs the theorization. Uh, I'll then uh, explain some of methodology um, and then we'll follow, follow with some feminist critiques to PCBE and cybersecurity policies. And then I will go through a feminist theorization of cybersecurity to tackle and identify online extremism. And conclusion of further thoughts. Uh, yeah, so the research question I'm exploring in this report are what does it mean to adopt a feminist approach to cybersecurity and extremism? And how do perceptions of gender influence the way we approach online abuse and extremism? So some brief context uh, to this. So we know already that online abuse and extremism disproportionately targets marginalized people in our society. Uh, so this can be women, people of color, non-binary people and trans people. And of course, um, many times these also intersect uh, with each other um, along with other um, identities as well. Uh, currently, cybersecurity and PCV policy frameworks uh, fail to center the experiences and needs of victims and survivors of online abuse and extremism. Uh, and I mean, if I to do so, we also see that tech companies and states also fail to combat extremism. Uh, so these are the main issues this uh, approach or organization address. Uh, and as you can see, I have uh, taken some screenshots of very recent uh, campaigns or news uh, articles uh, commenting on 
us not really being able to support survivors and victims um, of online abuse and extremism. So for the first one, for example, we have the uh, UK uh, charity Glitch UK, who um, are doing a campaign to include misogyny uh, within online safety bill, as well as center survivors of that. We also have a news article mentioning that we are not haven't been able to support all survivors from the Manchester attack, uh, as well as an article um, showing that we also failed to help online abuse survivors. Uh, so the argument I'm putting forward, so uh, at base, at core, uh, if you think about the feminist um, theorization of cybersecurity, uh, we want to challenge online violence by bringing marginalized people's experience and experiences into the center of cybersecurity and PCV policies, uh, as well as design responses that also at the same time uh, tackle structures of oppression and violence, actually where this violence stems from. Um, so applying this to a context uh, when we talk about internet-centered policies, such as cybersecurity and PCV, uh, the first core, uh, three core shifts. The first one is to incorporate misogynist and racist online abuse as forms of extremism that informs extremism. Uh, the second is to shift the focus on responding to attacks and violence to actually addressing structural violence online. And the third one is to empower and center victims and survivors of online abuse and extremism. And I'll go through them a bit more in detail um, further on in this uh, presentation. Uh, I want to address the methodology, because uh, I think this one is very important, and it's also uh, the previous panel mentioned how we are doing research, how we're making policies, have effects, uh, and are informed by our positionalities, and all along that. Um, so this report ad adopts an understanding of feminism, it's a knowledge of Black and decolonial feminism, Feminism is a political project um, which strives to eliminate, eliminate uh, gendered and sexist oppression, and this cannot be done uh, without also eliminating intersecting structures of oppression. We're talking, for example, about white supremacy, talking about cis heteronormativity, uh, and so on. Um, this also includes acknowledging that mar marginalization um, of people is always embedded in histories of imperialism and colonialism, and it is all uh, still affecting um, how we are um, doing things uh, to this day. Um, this also includes um, centering marginalized processes of knowledge making um, and production. So uh, again, uh, to uh, repeat from the previous panel, uh, this uh, means actually critically looking into who are we listening to um, who are being given the space and so on, who are also not giving the space to other people. So, and how does this inform our uh, political decision making? I am using emotion in my research as a part of methodology. Um, this includes investigate effect and effect, um, as well as also acknowledging that emotions are not always taken seriously depending on who it is to express them uh, and what kind of emotion and so on. This report is also informed by 12 semi-structured interviews uh, conducted with experts and professionals uh, working in the tech, NGO sector, research sector, as well as victims of online abuse. And sometimes these are intersecting. Um, the report is also informed by my first hand data gathered from a digital um, ethnographic method I've done on a misogynist incel forum. Um, uh, for a period of one year, um, in SOS, I'm sure many people here know about it. Um, yeah, so I just want to give you a bit of further context um, into uh, what this um, theorization is kind of drawing the conclusion or solutions or you know thoughts from uh, basically, uh, and this includes the feminist critiques of um, current PCBE. Um, policies as well as uh, in the academic sector, for example, terrorism studies. So um, currently we're not seeing that PCBE policies recognize or frameworks recognize all threats posed by actors, extremist actors in cyberspace, uh, along with terrorism studies and PCV policies, 
we also failed with, to properly engage with the politics of misogyny and racism, uh, particularly. And I mean, we particularly see this in the disengagement uh, with uh, misogynist and racist online abuse and the online realm of it, uh, and what we're allowing and not allowing. So this is uh, still, even though we do know that uh, online abuse um, is extensively used by a range of different extremist actors, so again, misogynist incels, uh, white supremacist, uh, Islamist extremists, and so on. So uh, a bit of a conclusion there, uh, we can then potentially say that misogynist and racist abuse, online abuse, are not being viewed as extreme enough to be incorporated into PCV policies. And what does that mean uh, when we are looking at this uh, and how we are forming our policies? I also want to add that online abuse is, abuse is important to study and include uh, in PCV policies because in its essence, online abuse reinforces supremacist logics of dominance. So the, the act works to police people, to correct them, to put them in the place. So it is a tactic of systematic intimidation. So addressing some of the bias in cybersecurity uh, frameworks and pol um, policies in, in a traditional uh, ones. So cybersecurity concerns and policies are important to acknowledge as well and bring into our work on tackling online extremism because cybersecurity policies set standards for how we establish threats in and to cyberspace. So cybersecurity policies can therefore either legitimize or delegitimize uh, threats happening on the internet as long with uh, technologies that concern our use of the internet. Um, traditionally, concerns about security um, have been approached through a militarized lens and centered on the protection of states or states. Um, approaches to cybersecurity also follow the same pattern. So the risk of attack is usually the focus of national cybersecurity and foreign policies, uh, a pattern that also follows suit in corporate settings, uh, where ensuring the security of corporate information and data is prioritized to uh, abuse that might happen within uh, the organization, for example, or if we're talking about tech sector or tech companies, uh, the abuse that is happening on the platform. Um, so two scholars uh, on cybersecurity, Egloff and Dan Cavalty, have argued that the process of attribution is key to understanding what is considered of um, political importance in cybersecurity. So attribution is the assessment of who is responsible of cybersecurity threats and what their intent was. Attribution therefore lays the foundations of a knowledge creation process and reinforces cybersecurity standards and practices centered on attacks uh, made by usually enemies uh, that are um, allocated with that um, um, state, that um, category or labor. Um, so, cybersecurity policies uh, therefore also reinforce gendered and racist um, uh, privileges uh, of structure of security privilege uh, because. These policies tend to not acknowledge everyday abuse um, of cyberspace, um, such as already mentioned and, uh, and um, shown uh, misogynistic and race abuse, uh, particularly. Yes, uh, and also just an example of where we can also see where um, cybersecurity threats uh, can be malleable. Uh, so recently, for example, the debate on TikTok, and particularly in the US, but also elsewhere, um, where the issue of what is private or public and kind of uh, where the threat lies really shows uh, where bias in the process might, uh, might uh, lie. So uh, there's been concerns on that the state is under surveillance, the US is under surveillance, because TikTok is Chinese owned and potentially then uh, the Chinese state is um, surveilling uh, the US through the data given by um, citizens of the US and working within the public sector. Uh, and this has been a pretty forceful uh, response by uh, people in charge or in pol of political uh, decision making. 
Uh, whilst we know that there are extensive uh, abuse made every day on TikTok and has been before this also, this concern also kind of came up to the surface and bubbling. Uh, and we haven't seen the similar, um, similar kind of counteraction to that abuse um, uh, when it uh, was about the everyday use and everyday abuse of uh, people um, through the apps. So just to conclude that attribution of threats, the process of that, tend to adapt to the interest of national security, but also commercial interests. So um, then further conclusion to both of these um, points, context, uh, perpetrators of misogynist and racist online abuse are not considered threats of value in either cybersecurity policies or PCV policies. So how should we deal with this? Um, I won't go into the silence and the flattening part. All, I am exploring that um, more in the report, just to explain how online abuse, again, is a violent um, act. Um, so uh, on to a feminist realization of cybersecurity, what it is. So again, uh, it's supposed to center marginalized people in our responses. Uh, so victims, survivors of online abuse and extremism. Uh, and to work to counter the structures of power uh, from which this violence stems from. Um, so to identify and tackle this, um, we have three core shifts. Uh, first one to incorporate misogynist and racist online abuse as forms of extremism. Uh, second, to shift the focus from responding to attacks to also addressing structural violence online. Uh, and third, to empower and center victims and survivors of online abuse uh, and extremism in our responses. Uh, and I have tried to illustrate with some arrows that, that all of these also kind of need to be, happen at the same time for actually to be useful, impactful, and hopefully not co-opted uh, in this message, message uh, as the previous panel also mentioned. So, uh, so just go a bit further into what I'm meaning um, or what the focus is in this, uh, these three shifts. So the first one, incorporating gendered and racist online abuse into conceptions of extremism. So the use of internet uh, to create insecurity and fear is indeed an intentional act uh, that reinforces supremacist structures. So if we are not addressing violence that affects a certain group of people, uh, and if we're already, you know, as we have identified some people who do receive this abuse more, uh, we are not addressing all the harmful practices and politics that are happening online. Uh, and this is despite knowing, if we're going to connect it again to the extremism space, the misogyny and hostile sexism have been shown to be the factors most strongly associated with support for violent extremism. Uh, and we also know in general that we do see um, less uh, responses to, for example, white supremacist violence uh, in society. And this also speaks to the politics in general that's going on and what kind of structural uh, oppression and violence uh, that is reinforced through also our inaction in things or two things. So to address uh, this imbalance, um, we need to incorporate uh, gendered and racist online abuse into our conceptions of extremism to be able to answer to a wide range of um, harmful structures and to also be able to allocate some of the resources that we do invest in PCV policies and programs, as well as cybersecurity programs as well. Um, I also want to uh, address the fact that um, it's also kind of mentioned the, the gaming part panel kind of spoke to that the whole division of what the online offline might insinuate when we are thinking about uh, the harms that are conducted online and the effects that actually has. So um, the whole idea of what is extreme and not extreme as well, we can unpack that as well. Um, but to state that online abuse is not extreme enough, um, to be included in our internet-centered policies um, means to also then dismiss the physical, psychological, and emotional impacts and effects 
online abuse actually has um, and through uh, the kind of supremacy structure of being able to move away from or to bring in or you can move if you're a perpetrator anywhere basically and still uh, commit the violence as well as not really escaping the violence if you want to be connected to the internet for example and your uh, devices if you're a victim survivor try to get away from the violence I feel like I might have uh, tangled myself there but happy to talk that through later on as well um yeah so on to the second shift um one of the key problems um in particularly cyber security policies but also in pcv policies is that we are putting a lot of effort on the attacks and responding to these so when the violence happened uh, rather than also addressing the effects of this violence and potentially um prevent uh, this um, and tackling the source of this uh, violence and problem. So for example, we've seen that uh, whilst content regulation are addressing an element of abuse and violence, and it's important, um, for example, by removing accounts from platforms um, that have engaged in, in violent action online. We also see that these perpetrators or people um, tend to move to other platforms, even more secure platforms, and can continue to um, reinforce uh, their violent actions or commit their violent actions. Um, and this is part of the approach we are dealing with here. So the attribution um, of threats um, works to individualize the source of the violence uh, rather than challenge the structure of the violence. Um, so, as such, we see little impact on a struggle to actually eliminate this extremism, um, which is something we should definitely um, engage more um, resources in. Um, so, I'm not saying that we should stop removing content or anything, but we also need to have a more long term solution to tackle the structures if we're um, serious to actually. Uh, eliminate these types of extremisms. Um, so this means, for example, to start thinking more holistically about what it is, what it means to be safe in cyberspace, uh, make it more human-centered. So, for example, we can start by acknowledging who are actually protected by current mechanisms um, we we pose as um, security enhancing, enhancing. And currently, we see that. Uh, the abuse of women, people of color, and uh, non-binary people, trans people are still receiving a lot of abuse. So we really need to uh, rethink uh, what we can do to actually stop this. So, and on to the, the last one. Um, so, uh, third one is centering victims as part of online PCV strategy. Um, so, if we do not care for victims and survivors of online abuse and extremism, we also then send a message that that isn't really important to us, uh, which do also send a message that the violence can continue. So if we then uh, do the opposite, so centering care for people, we then also potentially can systematically challenge supremacist logics. We say that we do not allow um, um, actions of dominance, such as on an abuse, uh, to uh, be uh, exerted on our in our online spaces as long as how that relates to the offline space uh, by also centering victims as part of our strategy uh, this also allows us to actually see where we are failing and uh, if we talk to people who are affected we know how to respond to the violence so this informs us how to make impact interventions um, so to do this, we need to do more collaborative work uh, with victims and survivor, survivors of um, this violence. So we can address direct needs and also needs down the line. This is not something that's just a one time thing. It should be an investment uh, to properly help. So for example, in the last panel, um, um, someone said that, for example, talking to women's organizations is a good way to do it as well. Uh, and collaborate with them, for example. And I also had a point that people have people, no quick fixes, no AI, uh, AI chats, because we do need people to help, uh, to actually help people go um, talk through their trauma, what they've experienced, 
uh, to basically, yeah, make it more human centered to care as much as we can. So, uh, conclusions, very worthy slide, some th further thoughts uh, to this. Um, a feminist theorization of cybersecurity can help us to identify and tackle online extremism. Uh, but again, it needs to be tailored to certain contexts uh, to actually see what kind of um, let's say power structures in play is actually going on in these contexts. Is um, this applied to uh, you know tech platforms as well as geographically uh, different contexts and so on. Uh, and also this is the point of uh, hope. We can choose how we want the internet to be. Uh, we are making the policies, we are making the actions. Uh, so yeah, um, so individualized threats as is currently being done in traditional cybersecurity policy frameworks do not actually tackle the structural mechanisms that feed ex extremism and terrorism, nor does it help uh, people who experience this abuse to deal with a trauma um, and to heal. Um, so we need to recognize the value in redirecting resources to victims and survivors into responses. Um, and then also focusing on victims make us reevaluate who is actually being protected or not, and what is the effects of abuse, uh, online abuse and extremism happening online. Um, so one of the radical potentials of this approach is that while caring for victims, uh, we can also invest in developing responses that uh, build stronger supportive and educated counterparts against abuse. Again, if we do not allow abuse to happen, we'll send a message that we don't want abuse to happen. Uh, but able to do this, we need to collaborate over many different sectors um, along with, and I think the forefront, uh, we need to see um, cybersecurity uh, policies and PCV policies to actually make a stance on this and uh, be there in forefront to show that uh, this shouldn't happen. And when I'm saying that, I'm also meaning national as well as corporate uh, policies. Uh, and also I just want to um, highlight some organizations and groups that actually do really good work on addressing uh, inequalities uh, happening online or expressed online. Uh, so for example, I would mention Glitch UK, uh, centering and working on eliminating or um, affecting policies um, on online abuse, particularly online abuse to target black women. Chain is also a really good um, organization that focuses on uh, making support for domestic abuse uh, victims or survivors uh, as well, many different languages, making it accessible. And the group Autism Against Fascism is also a really good one uh, that strives to make uh, information about fascism and extremism uh, accessible to neuro neurodiverse uh, people. And that's me, thank you. Now it's so lovely. Normally we don't get to give applauses because it's all online and this very strange silence. So I'm so glad that you're all here in person. Uh, so I, I think what else has done is an immense piece of work in linking things together in a very sensible and coherent way. Uh, there's so much complexity in their work and this report is a very elegant and refined approach to this topic. So again, congratulations, Elsa. Couldn't be more thrilled to have you on board. Now, we have some time for questions. I'm just trying to find the unlock. Okay. Yeah, I had it before and I, I fully failed this time. Uh, so we open the floors to questions. Anna's hand was first up, as always. <laughs> if you could please pass over the mic. There's value and reliability. Um, Elsa, what a privilege to be in the room and get to hear you speak about this. This is so awesome. Uh, and I loved everything you had to say, um, but I do have a question. Um, so one proposal that you put forward is incorporating misogynist racist abuse into our views on online extremism. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the concept of extremism here, whether that's useful as a frame. Um, put differently, in your view, is the solution to incorporate gendered and racist online abuse into this framework already, or is there 
a better way of thinking about this? Do we perhaps need different tools to keep women and people of color safe online? Is there another? We'll come back to the crowd in a second. Can I ask this one first? Um, thank you, Anna. Um, so much. Um, it is uh one of my recurrent um thoughts as well. Uh, to be honest, um, because um as you all heard, I have a really politics background, and has been kind of insinuating and expressed in some of that depends as well. Um, extremism is and can be used as a political tool to apply as well. And that's my main concern, I guess, would be to incorporate that together with misogyny and racism, for example. Because um, in general, I'm not in favor or supporting uh, carceral approaches, um, so carceral feminism, for example, um, into this. So the main point in incorporating this in PCBE and cybersecurity policies would basically be to have it in print to be able to reallocate resources as it currently stands. Uh, and I think it could be a useful way in that sense. Um, but I do think it's something that we, if it happens, uh, which uh, it might not, um, uh, is considering politics, um, uh, it still needs to be continuously investigate and look into uh, to see if any abuses is happening with it. Because um, as we do know, um, particularly with extremism, terrorism uh, label, uh, I lost my point. Yeah, manipulated by states, thank you. <laughs> uh, but also that, again, I was gonna say the carceral feminists like the the main critique for that is that it will be abused and used against people who are marginalized, basically. So yeah, I have my, you know, it's useful in some instances, the possibilities to it, um, uh, but it needs to be under, you know, under a looking glass or whatever, um, um, if whenever it is applied. Any questions, Anna? And one from Jordan as well. We'll take two at once. Everybody here first. David Paper, I missed some of the initial bits. I was going to ask you who do you think should be gatekeepers in this process? And where should the gatekeepers be based? Because I believe we're now in a sort of multipolar world. Unless you're talking about context, you know, post Brexit context, UK context. Also, to remember that there are cultural parameters and they don't always identify um, context that well. And Hello, really enjoyed your talk and I am very excited to read the report. Um, I had a question that kind of goes to, I also have a politics background. And so in instances like this, when I'm thinking of like how to actually operationalize this, something that came up was the, op the possibility of people becoming tokens in this because when oftentimes when people try to center people of color, especially like I find it a lot in the US with black women when they try to uh, utilize them in like campaigns or something. They often become tokens for the campaign. Mm -hmm. How, in this instance, would you avoid doing that with a person of color or a non-binary person or someone who's LGBTQ or any of the other marginalized groups that you mentioned? I think the thing so much for the questions. Um, yeah, I'm uh, responding now. Um, yeah, so. Um, Gatekeepers, uh, not a big fan, but I guess like just in general, looking over how it is applied uh, in our context. Um, and I do, uh, I will answer a bit both at the same time, so I think I think it's important. Um, it is, I, I emphasize the whole thing that it should be applied to the context as well, because at the moment it is very broad. Uh, and um, who is, marginalized in a certain context is not marginalized in another context. So I do 
but like the idea is to constantly be engaged in conversations with people who have been identified as uh, people who are uh, rece receiving or targeted uh, with the abuse and violence because it can also change right um so um that is basically that but it's not like fully you know you say um you don't have the full answers in that way it kind of needs to develop so this is like a, a first kind of focus what i've been trying to do um but I see that some things can also potentially be changed and altered um, to adapt to actually what is impactful, what is useful, what, who, how to address the abuse and violence. Because currently we are seeing there's a lack of actually helping uh, many people who receive abuse, not everyone, but many, uh, too many. Um, so that was my very vague uh, response to that. But I think it's very, big issue not being um, tokenized um, in these approaches, particularly when thinking about the whole, um, it's going to be critical about the feminist table as well, how feminism has been used to also promote violence, like bad things. Um, so yeah, answer that, continuously engage in conversation. Uh, and this is obviously all very work heavy, um, research is heavy. So, um, but yeah, I want to um, again emphasize it's like a long term thing that you continue to be open to change uh, to things. Actually, it's reality and how it changes, as well as how threats um, are changing and how we see that. Uh, so, again, gatekeepers, this is hopefully something that could be applied to particular platforms, perhaps to help out, but also, as I mentioned, in other. Um, platforms and uh, panels um, earlier today and um, how we need to cater to different countries legislation as well how that is adapt and what kind of um um what to say to give you a the united it's an experiment. It's yeah. Yeah. And it, that's. Mm. So how that's been over time. Mm. Definitely, but, uh, you know, some of those very fine. Yeah. But then over time, and this is a little bit of we call it mm. way back. Yeah. Now, suddenly, the rest of the world then is following. So, suddenly, the narrative is going to change. Mm. As to the meaning of liberal democracy. Yeah, no, I agree that. That's yeah, yeah. The, we can also talk about what liberal democracy is as well, like all these categories. Um, but yeah, but I think that's also where we kind of need to emphasize the role of corporations as well. Uh, what yeah, kind of I'm ethics fine. and the cybersecurity um, aspects and policies that what they can implement and actually change as well. Because we can't always uh, rely on uh, that governments are insinuating these changes. I mean, we see that already now with the whole kind of blame game who responsibility is it for that online abuse actually happening is it tech companies or is it governments and is the reason why there should be debate we shouldn't be like too hasty in some decisions but obviously sometimes when it takes a long time to make these decisions we also see a lot of violence and abuse happening uh, yeah conversation <laughs> so we have okay we're going to go Catherine, Jonathan, and then in the middle here, and then we'll come down front back to Vic after that. Hi, thank you again so much for presenting today. Um, I just wanted to ask, you talked a lot about victim support for um, people who have suffered from online extremism and abuse. Do you think um, from the conversations that you've had or the interviews that that would be more effective in like a government supported institute or are you seeing more kind of grassroots advocacy groups, um, starting support groups, and that being um, a bit more effective in reaching victims? It's Jonathan there. Um, yeah, I just want to say thanks. It's, it's quite interesting to see. Um, so I'm John. I'm from the UK embassy in Belgium. I'm covering counterterrorism, counterextremism. Uh, it's not that often. I, 
I think in my experience that you hear about racism being a kind of driver of uh, extremism or terrorism, uh, quite often we, we hear about ideologies, different ideologies, for example. Um, so thank you for introducing that to the discussion. Uh, my, my question is similar to one that you asked actually. Um, just sort of what are your recommendations for, for victim support? What sort of things do you recommend? It'd be just interesting to hear that from that perspective. And John, how long are your arms? Can you read? Yeah, right. Thank you. Um, fabulous presentation and really, really interesting work. Um, my name is Erin. I'm also a PhD student and I come from Centric in Sheffield. And not to sound like a broken record, I asked this question earlier again today at the mental health talk. But what comes next for this research? Because again, I resonate so deeply with a lot of the conclusions and further thoughts and recommendations. But I'm wondering how we then practically bring them into particularly kind of on the ground work and what are your thoughts for that with your research? Yes, thank you so much for uh, all the questions. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, my my thoughts, my this, I'm also a bit of ideals. Um, so, so who to support victims uh, and survivors of this violence? Um, I think a key problem we're seeing now in in what I've seen in major um, social media platforms with a lot of this abuse happening is that yes, there are some kind of some sites. So, what do you, what do you say? Sub pages uh, to these platforms that are kind of pointing to some resources you can go to, uh, but there's no really further action from that. Um, so a uh, key problem with that uh, is not that they do uh, refer people to, to local, um, for example, uh, women's shelters or anything like that, is that that's where the action stops and it could potentially add more work to these organizations. The main key thing to do uh, is to recognize uh, the extent and the impact of online abuse on victims so that we can allocate resources and I hope that states are a big part of doing that because uh, they're you know where a lot of money is as long as we take companies uh, to do that um, in implementing this women's shelters and other uh, organizations uh, grassroots organizations uh, that do deal with abuse online abuse and violence um, gender-based violence um, uh, racist violence uh, and so on are very important I think in in reaching out and helping uh, victims and survivors as well. Um, although I want to see some kind of like global collaboration in in effectively uh, distributing um, resources, um, so we don't have it just uh, again. It comes back to the whole uh, continuation of uh, colonization, imperialism, and so on, uh, where the resources are uh, that can actually be shared, um, and also through that um, help people reach these sources. We had, for example, an issue of affording um, um, mental health care or just you know, physical care as well. People can also have uh, physical um, say, uh, effects as well. Um, so that's what I want to see. Um, currently, I think actually I saw uh, just today it was a email from a UN convoy that also yeah, kind of recognize at least like the gendered online abuse as well. So there is some kind of things going on. We just need things to happen a bit more. And uh, yeah, first thing is to recognize it, actually include it, and then hopefully see the money also work to it. Uh, so it can be hopefully effectively distributed as well. It's a very open and not super concrete answer, but that's a uh, what I want to see. Now, who would like to be responsible for the last questions of the conference? Big pressure, big head of questions. Uh, anyone else would like final question or please last question, Vic? Excellent. Love this for us. Um, hi, um, um, so, um, yeah, I, um, I actually have uh, two questions I can hopefully uh, I'm happy to ask you uh, 
not take up too much time. So uh, my first question is, uh, uh, when you mentioned uh, cooperation, uh, how does, uh, how will it work when we are uh, discussing something like, like a, uh, something with a uh, big user base and is uh, evident run by someone who clearly has a, um, well, well, a uh, well documented uh, ideological bias, like uh, um, a, uh, I didn't want to uh, name any names, but uh, it's, pro it's probably really clear that I'm um, talking about Twitter, where uh, they respond to uh, pressing all press inquiries with the uh, poop emoji, as you might have heard. And uh, yeah, and, um, wondering how um, how one could uh, relate these ideas to um, a uh, tech 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 company that tech, tech, <laughs> a uh, tech company like that. And uh, my other question is that um, mm, I'm sorry if. Uh, this um, discussion of feminism goes it goes a bit uh, beyond the uh, depths of knowledge for uh, some uh, cybersecurity and uh, uh, extremism researchers, but um, yeah, um, a fraction of the uh, transphobia on the on social media uh, is um, like. Um, is um, espoused by um, people who are or were uh, um, second wave feminists, which uh, um, which uh, are uh, which are seen as um, very um, white and uh, white cis and uh, middle class uh, women centered by uh, third wave and fourth fourth wave feminists, which are um, some of the uh, strongest advocates uh, that uh, trans people have. And uh, I'm wondering if, uh, how, how, uh, how this can be, uh, how, um, how this can be uh, explained, uh, by the uh, idea of uh, attribution. What, two wonderful last questions. Yeah. Anna Hanaway also bringing it up with your CT member company to, yeah. with some instructions to industry. Yeah. Elsa, please. Thank you so very much. Um, yeah, two really good uh, questions. And I also really like the, the second one because it also gives some kind of like um, having to like apply it to attribution as well. I think you can do that. Um, but the first one, the corporation tech company, they're problematic in Twitter, I think you mentioned. Yeah, good. So, so I'm not um, thinking something else. Yes. I mean, big problem with uh, companies that doesn't want to collaborate um, or cooperate on this one. Um, also want to address in, gen in general um, that how we are communicating or you know, finding people who want to share their experiences of online abuse um, and extremism can also be complicated. Uh, Anna said it in the previous panel, for example, we don't want to re-traumatize people either. So seeking up people is not necessarily the, the best thing to do either. Um, and I mean, on Twitter, we see a lot of abuse happening. Uh, and yeah, I think it's a really important thing to think about how to collaborate with um, tech companies on that as well. Uh, because we don't want them to extract data from people either. So it's a good thing that needs to, or a good question and concern that really needs to be thought through even more that I can't really do this time, uh, but needs to be done uh, whenever this is applied, if it is applied um, as well. And uh, the second question um, about uh, transphobia among certain uh, feminists, uh, Turfs um, uh, as have been kind of documented uh, recently. Uh, we do see that um, so uh, turfs uh, trans institutionary 
radical feminists um, are definitely reinforcing structures of powers of white supremacy, um, as well as misogyny as well. Everything is basically. Um, and I mean, they do, I guess we can apply the attribution process in many places as well. They obviously have individuals, some kind of threat who doesn't really exist or shouldn't be uh, their concern. Um, but yeah, I think I need to think of that one a bit more. Um, but they are definitely part of the problem. That they are definitely, you know, reinforcers of uh, this and constantly also engage in online abuse. And again, I guess it also shows that all women are not marginalized, are the people who we should um, center in these um, policies um, on online abuse. They can also perpetrate this, as mentioned as well in the previous panel. Yeah. Incredible. So let's give Elsa a big round of applause for him. Wow, everybody, we have reached the end of the third GINA annual conference. Firstly, thank you all for coming. It's been such a pleasure to have so many faces who we know very well, but also a lot of new faces join us these last two days. I want to thank Maddie for all of her work putting the conference together and manning the AV for the last one and a half days. It's a big job. And then obviously we'd like to thank Maddie, Federica, Julian and Vic for all of their work helping out. It's been an effort of kindness and generosity from them as well. And then ICSR for always having us and looking after us and GIFCT obviously as our funder. Uh, so thank you all so much for coming. If you could just leave your name badges somewhere obvious and we'll reuse them because we do like the environment despite the amount of printing we've done over the last 48 hours, please do not be deceived. Uh, and if you have any questions, please let us know. The recordings will be offline shortly. Elsa's report is already on the GNET website so you can go and read it there. But thank you so much. Again, just walk out the green doors. You won't get stuck. Can we also acknowledge Nagla and all the work she's done? Thank you. Let's also pass to Maddie. You are released. That went really well.